I think they backtracked for six months. So whoever took it, not only did they take it out of circulation, but they went in the database and they erased it. And I, I'm serious about this. I enlisted in the Marine Corps on the, under the delayed entry program in July of 1994. And I graduated Mount Tabor uh, High School and went to Salem, North Carolina. On, on, in June of uh, 1995, and I, I uh, enlisted, of course, you know, delayed entry a year. So I went to boot camp on the 18th of June, which is a Sunday. I went to boot camp, I, I graduated 8 September of 95, uh, and from there my MOS was 0311, which was a grunt. Uh, and from there I went to School of Infantry Training at Camp Geiger in, uh, in late September of 95. I did not complete training because I was injured and I hurt my back and I was sent to uh, the, 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 uh, the medical platoon there on, the, on, the, on Camp Geiger, North Carolina, which is adjacent to uh, Camp Lejeune. And I was there, for, I don't know, for about a month or, or two months. And in January, uh, January, late January of 96, uh, I was given new orders and given a new MOS, Military Occupational Skill. Uh, listing a 7212 Stinger Avenger gunner, and subsequently uh, given 10 days leave and then sent to Fort Bliss uh, at El Paso, Texas. So I was in training for to, to be an air defense gunner on the, the FIM-92 uh, 90, Alpha uh, Stinger missile, it's a surface air missile, uh, and the Avenger weapon system, which is a pedestal and a turret uh, with uh, with eight Stingers mounted on the back of a, a, a Humvee. And I was in training for uh, February to uh, late May of uh, 96. And then after graduating from that school, I was reassigned my first duty station, uh, uh, 2nd Marine Air Wing, uh, 28th uh, Marine Air Control Group, 2nd Low Altitude Air Defense Battalion in Cherry Point, North Carolina. With, and I was assigned a Battery B uh, in, uh, in June of that of uh, 96. And I went on uh, several ops, the operations, we call them ops for short. And uh, basically, I was there, and then I was transferred over to uh, the, the section for laser strike in February of '97. Uh, after going to weapons and tactics instructor uh, 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 197 in uh, Yuma, Arizona, when I got back, I was asked if I wanted to go, and I said sure. So I volunteered, and I was sent to the section. And then we shipped out in May, oh excuse me, of March, excuse me, of uh, that that uh, that year. We were sent there to uh, provide perimeter security to this radar installation. Basically, this radar station was tracking supposedly drug aircraft that were exiting in and out of the Peru and Bolivian uh, airspace. Basically, what we were doing there, you know, we had live ammo and weapons. And uh, one day, uh, Sergeant uh, Allen and uh, and uh, uh, the other the other sergeant, and I'll, I'll remember his name soon. Sergeant Atkins, they were, and Sergeant uh, Montalegra, and he, he was uh, he was a staff sergeant, E7, or, I mean, excuse me, E6, and the guys were E5 sergeant, and uh, they they came to us and said, look, you know, we got we got a situation where we we have one an aircraft crash that's possibly friendly, and they need us to go and, and secure the crash site. And we're like, fine. So it, this is early. This is late at night. I know about 11 or 12 at night. And I was on guard duty that night, so I was already up. And it was my shift. We have 12-hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off, and where we where we rotate the, the, the our section. Uh, so we all went out that night. We got up, I don't know, three or four in the morning, and headed out in Humvees. We had about five or six Hummers, and we drove to where we needed to go. And then we, from there, you know, we had to hunt through the bush. So we got there, I don't know, six, seven, just, just one daylight, it just, just started to get light. And uh, well, we found the area really easy because there, there was a huge gash in the land where, where something had crashed and it, it, it didn't break anything. You know, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a crash site where you, know, you, had, you know, had trees you know, just broken like, like in half. Everything was burned and it was like, like if you had almost cut like a, a warm butter with a knife, I mean it was just, it's like it's it's like something on fire or had energy or some kind of energy like a laser almost had 
had like gutted. I mean, it was really strange. And anyway, I was I was in the front with Sergeant Allen and Sergeant Atkins. We were up front, and we were we were point basically, and we were like I don't know 10, 20 meters ahead of everyone else. We had we all had maps and radios and compasses, so we knew so we wouldn't get lost. And basically, we were the first ones to see the object. And basically, what happened is we didn't go straight up the hill because basically this thing went up the hill and then off into the side of, 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 of the ravine or the ridge. This is about a 200 foot ridge at least. Solid granite. Or, I mean, I don't, it's rock. I don't know if it's granite. It's just, it was buried in, a, in, in the side of a cliff. But anyway, we didn't go straight up. We went to the, to the, to on to the left and walked up to the top of the ridge. And that's when we saw the craft. This is a huge ship. and. You know, I, I used to be into sci-fi movies when I was a kid, but this is nothing like I'd ever seen. And when I first saw it, you know, I was scared. It scared the, you know, the heck out of me, you know. I didn't know what to do, and, and it was just, I was con really, it was really confusing. So we, I went, we all climbed down, and um, it was, it was buried for about a 45 degree angle and into the side of the, uh, into the, into the side of the, 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 the cliff there, the, the, the ridge. And uh, I mean, this is a steep cliff. I mean, it's straight up and down. And uh, it was dripping this syrup like, uh, like syrup viscosity, this liquid. Uh, it was everywhere, all down, everywhere when we went down there because there were plants and everything. And it was, it was weird. It was a, a, a purplish green color. And it was, it was gr a greenish purple. And it kind of like like fluctuated like you couldn't really when you you'd look at it one time then you look at it again and it would like it's almost like it I don't know if it was like alive and it was just changing, but every time you looked at it you saw a different shade of, of greenish purple. It was strange. There was a, there was one light on it that slowly went around and it, and, and the machine I could hear it, I could hear I guess because it was still functioning and it had like a like a, a hum to it, like like a really bass. Like say if you unplugged an amp from a guitar, that kind of, mm, you know, it was really, really, you know, it was really deep, and it kind of fluctuated, and then finally it just cut off, and everything just seemed to stop, except the colors and the shades, and it was still that way. Uh, when I was looking at the craft, it was buried, so I could see the back of it, and there were these large vents. Well, that, they look like vents, sort of like a fish gill, on the back. I couldn't see around the other side. And I guess I'm assuming that it was the same way on the other side. That looked like I don't know that, that they could that could have been used for propulsion. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, again, this 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 liquid that had come out of the ship was it got on my camis and you know it 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 discolored them and ate them almost like acid. And then it ate some of the skin off. Well, excuse me, the the hair off my arms. And it was and, and, and I didn't know that until later on. But basically, when I was down there with the ship. There was three holes, and I guess I'd assume that they were hatches, but I, 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 there's no way to tell. They were not flush with the uh, with with the body, the main body of the craft. There, I don't know, a few inches below. I knew there was one on top because you could s slightly see it. I don't know about the other side, but th there was another hatch, the same same width and diameter or whatever of the top hatch, and it was kind of crooked to the side, and it was half open. I didn't see any lights or anything coming out of it, but uh, I felt this presence. That it, it's real strange. I guess it was almost like, I think the creature. I, I told Leslie this. I thought the creatures were, they calmed me, and, and it was like weird. And they were. I think they were trying to communicate with me, like I guess telepathically. It's really weird, and I don't believe in it, in any of that stuff. But anyway, it was. I could I could hear like, and it was terrible because it, it kept going, and, and and it still comes and goes. It's like basically sitting in your car and turn on like an AM station that's not, you know, it's just white noise and it's turning it up really high. And that's what I heard when I, when I first got in there. Uh, this is pretty crude two-dimensional drawing, but this is jungle here and this was the craft and it, it was embedded uh, in, 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 in the rock like this. And I, I'm not sure if this tapered off or, or how it went, but uh, these right here are the hatches, these two objects here. This one was the one that was half open, and you could see into it, but I mean, it was just black. It was like looking into a closet. 10 meters in width and about 20 meters in length. I'm just not sure. That's just an estimate from what I remember. But it was huge. I mean, it was big, man. 
and it was shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop almost. It was really, it looked really aerodynamic, at least in the shape, but the closer I, I was close enough to take out detail on it, but every, every, it was not just smooth, there was, there was, you know, there was bumps and, you know, notches and things in it. It was really organic. It was almost like art. I, I, that, that's really how you would, it didn't look like something that, that somebody made in a shop, you know. It didn't have that clunkiness or that, 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 that tin can, you know, kind of. Deal. It was more of a. It was more of art. I would. I would say. It looked to be that it was. It, it could have been handmade, but you know, out of what and what materials, I don't know. Definitely not nothing like it. Nothing like titanium. It wasn't. It. See, this is the whole thing. It looked metal, but it, it didn't. It didn't have any reflection on it, man. I mean, you know, the 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 sun's coming down, and if you got something made of metal, regardless of it. I mean, maybe if it's subdued with paint and it's got a cami sheen on it, you know, you're not going to see any reflection. But you know, I could see the different the different shades of the craft. They didn't shine. It, it just like it was. It didn't reflect anything. And and I guarantee if I if I threw like a, a flashlight on it, wouldn't have reflected it. Well, the creatures, I think, were calling me to help them. Everything was going to be all right. Then I was so mesmerized and into it, and you know, Sergeant Allen and Atkins are they're hollering and they're cussing at me. You know, get the hell out of there. Why? Well, I, I think they why they I think that they were scared, and they didn't want me to get hurt. I don't I don't know. And they were real pissed off at me after subsequently. But uh, basically, what happened was uh, after we climbed back up, the uh, the the I think the DOE Department of Energy people were there. They knew about it, and I don't know why we went there still to this day. But anyway, I was arrested. Uh, I had all my gear taken from me by men in black camis, had no, no name tags. They, they were older men, probably in their thir late 30s or 40s. How long was I at the site? Uh, probably about 15, 20 minutes. We were the first people on the, on the, on the position, yeah. And then shortly you said there were other people? Right, uh, there were other people. I guess they were government, I don't know. They were there, and they had containment suits, and they, they had guys, they they had a position, that 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 was that looked like I don't know if it was already there or there was some gap in the jungle where they landed two CH-47 Chinooks, their army uh, uh, twin rotor, uh, you know, helicopters, and they're big, and they had guys coming out in these containment suits. They must have just got there, I don't know, while we were down in the gorge, because when we climbed up, there those guys were. And the, well, there were the, the guys in the black camis. And then they took me, they put me on a cot that they had, and they had me uh, cuffed with those, uh, they had me cuffed both hands down, and then they had my uh, my, my, my legs tied together with those, those uh, plastic fasteners that the police use. I don't know, you know, they're like kind of like cuffs. And then they took me in the CH-47, and they, they they sent me to. We we took off and and uh, and uh, they they didn't drug me or anything like that. And I was just awake there. And did they explain why they were treating you this way? No, no. They, they said that you know that that, that 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 I was. They were cussing at me, saying that I was a dumb asshole. And that why don't you why don't you fucking people ever you know pay attention to orders? And you weren't supposed to be there. And you're not supposed to see this. And you, you know you're you're going to be dangerous if we let you go and all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, I thought I was going. I thought they were going to kill me for about two days, I think. And uh, they had a, a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, and he did not I identify himself. He might have. I just don't remember. And he told me, you know, you know, uh, you know, if we just uh, took you out in the jungle, you know, they'd never find you out there. And I'm like, well. And, you know, I, I didn't want to say, you know, you know, I didn't want to test him to see if you'd really do that. So I said, yeah. And he's like, you got to sign these papers and you never saw this and I don't exist and this situation never happened. And if you tell anybody, uh, you know, you'll, you'll just come up missing. And, and he was a real abrasive, just, just, just an, uh, a cynical uh, asshole, I guess is the best way to put it. It was, I was at the same installation, but they had me segregated with Air Force personnel for like three weeks, and then after that, I was sent back, approximately. All I saw there was Americans, and there was a lot of other nationalities there. Chinese, Germans, I think, were there. I mean, a lot of other people were at this other base. 
But I mean, this thing, it was really, it, I mean, I didn't go in and all they did was take me to like a, like a, you couldn't call it a cell. It was more of like a, it was more like an interrogation room. And I sat in there for, I don't know, 15 hours. Uh, those guys with a, with, with a light, and I mean, they put this light in my face and they were yelling at me. And I couldn't really re readily identify any of these guys, but I knew, I knew that, I knew one of them was at the, at the crash site because they were, one of the guys that I recognized because he was in uh, black fatigues and he was like, what'd you see? And he's like, yeah, he's like growling. Mm. You know, he goes, are you a patriot? You like the constitution? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, we don't, we do it. You know, we're on our own program. You know, we don't obey. We just do what we want. And he's like, yeah. And they're like, mm, and they're growling and they're relishing, you know, and they're yelling at me and they're, they're hollering and cursing and you didn't see anything, you know, and we'll do you and your whole goddamn family. And they're, they're, you know, it was, it was basically that for about eight or nine hours. I mean, they took breaks. They were like, look, man, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to just, we're going to take you off in a helicopter and just kick your ass out, out in, out in the jungle. And you're just going to, you're you know, we're going to end you and all this. And they didn't physically, they didn't physically put their hands on me, but I was sitting in a chair and I was handcuffed to the chair and I couldn't move. So basically, you know, it was just a, this, this like harassment. I didn't eat anything for like a whole day. No water, no nothing, I just sat there. Uh, my section was about eight, eight to 10 guys. And they all saw it? No, uh, no, just me, Sergeant Allen, and Sergeant Atkins were the only ones that saw it. Now they saw the crash and well, at least, you know, the, the, the jungle where, where it came through, they saw all that, but they didn't go into the ridge. Cause like I said, we were 10 to 20 meters in front of them and they radioed to, you know, to haul that we found and everything's fine. I was in, it was in late March, early April of 97. So we're talking, like when I got back, you know, I approached Sergeant Allen about it. Because, of course, he's married and he's got like a, one or two kids. And I went to his house on, the, on base housing. and He got all upset and threw me out of his house, said he didn't want to talk about it. And, I mean, they scared, I guess they scared those guys too, man. And see, I mean, you got to understand, you know, I can't speak for the rest of the armed service. But the Marine Corps, everything's it's you know it's monolithic, and uh, when they're told to do something, they're gonna they're gonna do it, and and, and if you don't want to go along, they'll just they'll, they'll 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 basically railroad you. I didn't want to keep my mouth shut about it, and I told my first sergeant, uh, first sergeant Powell, I told him about it, and I don't even know if he I don't think he's still there anymore. I mean we're talking three years ago, so uh, yes, yeah, so there was life forms in the ship, I and I could they, they were. It's almost like uh, if someone was like reading your mind, and uh, that's the way it felt. And I felt like uh, I felt a presence, it was like supernatural. You know, it was no debris that I saw, but there were big gashes in the in the in the in the, in the rear of the uh, of the aircraft. And I, what I looked, what it looked like, is that it had been hit with maybe a serviced air missile. Uh, there were a couple Hawk batteries, and that's a homing all the way killer. That's a low to medium uh, air, uh, surfaced air, any, any aircraft missile. And basically, it doesn't have to hit the target in order to destroy the target. What it does is it gets in proximity of it and it has a high explosive fragmentation warhead and it basically explodes like a big shotgun in the vicinity of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the targeted uh, area. And, it, and by fragmentation, it's supposed to destroy the target or, 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 in, uh, or damage it so it won't be able to continue its mission. So it, I think we shot it down. This is what I think happened is we shot it down, the Peruvian shot it down, the other guys knew it was flying. I knew that these, these aircraft were flying because I had been in the command center there at the radar installation and, and, and I heard a couple women there in the Air Force talking about aircraft uh, flying in and out of the atmosphere at Mach 10 plus. So these aircraft are flying around there, you know, they're, you know, they're re-entering the atmosphere and whatever. And, you know, I believe that the higher ups knew it was flying in the area. And these were these large vents. They looked like they went into the craft, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell. But it, I mean, it was a shadow. That was the only thing that really cast a shadow. The rest of this, well, that was another thing was it, these vents casted a shadow where you could see where there wasn't light, but the, sh the sun was shining right on the object and it didn't cast a shadow, not on, on anything. And it was like, kind of like absorbing the light, it was weird. And this is not one of ours, cause you know, I'm, you know, in Stinger school, they teach you about all different kinds of aircraft. And 
stuff like that. And I knew I knew a lot of aircraft anyway because I, I like I like reading about aircraft and data and that stuff. And uh, well, essentially, when I saw it, I'm like, man, this is not this is nothing that I knew of. Okay, basically, the radar was was sitting, and this was again on a hill. It's cammed up, and you know it rotates and everything. And there's a command bunker that was built under the under the under the earth. And I mean, it looks like Star Wars in there. And I mean, it's it's total air conditioned. I mean, it's really nice. And there's like computers, and they got the the uh, the you know the control panels and everything that control the radars. And they're I guess they're linked to other sites, you know, and they get other data coming in. And well, we had guard duty, and I, I and the night that this happened. This was in the early evening, and it was my shift, and I was in there, and I was checking people going in and out. You know, they got ID, you know, checking out, whatever. So, like, these two girls, they come walking out, and they were talking about, well, we got these aircraft flying again, and, and the other girl says, yeah, you know, they're coming in and out of the atmosphere. But, but he came in there, and he told me to come back with them, and we go back there, and, and he goes, I want the logs, because they log all these flights coming in, you know, they're bearing what they are, what code they're squawking, all that. So he gets the books, and I had to sign off for him to take all that. I mean, when you got when you got objects that are re-entering the atmosphere and then stopping on a dime and then turning around and going exactly the opposite direction, you know, that's kind of strange. Meteors don't do that. Now, is this something that was rare or something that was happening? Oh, this, this happened happening all the time. There was like three or four incidents where I was duty there that the same uh, the same Air Force officer came in there to get books. And do you think these were tracked on radars? That yeah, the, 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 these were tracked from this particular radar that were logged in. The reason, I, I guess the reason they were taking them is they didn't want people to know that they're tracking these aircraft. I guess, I, I mean, again, this, I'm just assuming that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think they knew it was coming in and they said, we can't identify it, it's violating airspace. So, they could have radioed the Peruvians and said, take them out, and then they shot it down. I was confident that when I saw the, the aircraft, it had been hit by something, something that had, that had took it out. They were scared, and it was the, the apprehension, the fear, and then that they, that, they, that they were not here to harm us. That's really what, what it felt like, and I mean, that's not, that's not my own emotions. I've seen the creatures in my, in my thoughts. And uh, I've seen, I've, and I, I saw them what they look like. Oval egg head with big dark eyes, big eyes, uh, a nose and a small mouth, new ears. And they were projecting that they weren't here, they were here. They were here, to, they, they weren't here, you know, they, they were not gonna harm me. Mm -hmm. And that was basically that everything was gonna be all right, just help me get, just help us get out of here. Mm -hmm. I think there was, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how many were on the craft. You got the sense more than one. Yeah, definitely more than one. Probably about four or five. Did, you, did I think it was organic and alive? Yeah, yeah. I think that. Uh, I think uh, that, that 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 whole craft. It, it's kind of like. It's almost like if you had an extension like your arm or your leg, and uh, I think the way they can. Now, I mean, this is just from thinking about it that that the way they control the craft is with their thoughts, and they have no, no buttons or anything they push. It's not from Earth. And I mean, I knew that when I looked at it, you know. I mean, I'm not doing this to make money or, or publicity or anything, but I, I think it needs to be told. I think people need to hear it. Whether they agree with me or not is, is of no consequence. Their cover was there to track, uh, to track drug aircraft. I, I think, I, I don't know, but from what I understand, that they were doing a whole lot more than just tracking drug aircraft. I mean, they had uh, laser range finders and all kinds of high tech stuff that I've never seen before. And I couldn't really explain. I knew that there was a couple of LRFs there. I don't know what they were, uh, LRF laser range finder. I don't know what they had those do there, but they were huge, man. Looked like big telescopes, but they had them in a bunker. And, and they were, it was able to rise up and they can zoom around. And I saw them doing that. I mean, just a bunch of weird stuff. And then, not even that, we had like a live fire shoot in the jungle. And there was Green Berets, Army Airborne. I mean, a bunch of these spec ops guys, uh, Delta Force there, you know, the murderers at Waco were there, you know. So, you know, all these, you know, all these guys out there. I mean, the Chinese, Chinese are there. You know, they're out there training, man. And we're, they're training the Peruvians too. So it's weird, man, weird situation.
Oh, this is definitely something like NATO or some multi uh, multinational deal. And what I, I keep, you know, I keep going back and really thinking about that. Why are all these guys here? You know, why would the Chinese be concerned with drugs being smuggled or, you know, or any kind of drug paraphernalia being smuggled into the states? I mean, personally, I mean, I know for a fact that our government are the ones that are importing drugs. I mean, there, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, but the fact, uh, the, do I think that, 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 that this, this command center, I think it was permanent. I think it's been in operation for a while. They had the big D, you know, Delta Oscar Echo on, on the back of their, back of a couple of the guys were wearing like these, uh, these rain jackets because it had been raining the fall, the previous day and they were in there and there were other guys that were wearing containment like biological suits. It wasn't like that, it was more high tech. Like those big jump suits that you zip up the back and you can like wear a breathing apparatus in there. Those guys, there was about 30 of them at least. And they marched right by me as I was as I was being taken away. They were marching to get down into the cliff. I guess they were in there to check this thing out. What do I think happened? I think they went in there and they took everything out and they shipped it back home, I think. The behavior of the people, yeah, it was definitely, it was. this is routine, man. I mean, these guys are squared away. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been trained to do this stuff before. That was the atmosphere, the total professional, cold, uh, unassuming uh, nature. You know, it's just, you know, we're here to do a job and, you know, get the fuck out of our ways is basically the, the attitude. I was raised in a Christian home to believe that there was a God and that he created everything, you know, the universe. And here they are, these, these creatures that I've never seen before, never come in contact with. And this happens, man, and it just, it made me go cr almost crazy, you know. Not like suicidal, but I, I just couldn't. I had to like reevaluate everything that I knew. It's sort of like when you're a kid, you know, you've been told Santa Claus is, is, is you know, real, and then you find out that he's really not, and then the tooth fairy, you know, it's like now that you know there's no going back, there's like no, there's no denial, there's no saying, well, you know, this is, you know, I didn't really see this, and, and I couldn't really deal with it, you know, it was that, is that what do I do, you know, do I tell people? But I mean, who's going to believe that? That that a, that a lance corporal in the Marine Corps, in the Marine Corps in the middle of the fucking jungle is going to see an aircraft like this. It's more like I was sitting and watching a like a like a film, like I was sitting and I was watching what was happening, and I was uh, I was basically you know with these aliens, these creatures, and they were touching me. You know, not not like sexually or with uh, instruments or anything. Uh, they were holding my hands and they had their hands on me. And they only had four fingers, by the way. And what feeling did you get? It was a warm, like loving feeling, uh, like like you would have if you were with a family. These creatures are like, I guess you could, probably the closest thing I could say that they were like almost like angels. And if if I had to, I, I'd go with them right now. I, I mean, I'd get, I, 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 and I had this obsession with that. You know, I guess it was, I guess because of the pain of the experience and then the Marine Corps, that I just wanted to escape. You know, and uh, and. And I, I was thinking about, you know, being with these creatures a lot and wanting to go with them and wanting to get out of here. Because these different agencies are just on their own. They they, they don't obey the law. They, they're just, they're rogue, you know, they're just, they're just off on their own. I don't, do I think this is a project that goes up through the government and everyone has a piece in it? Uh, no. I think these guys just operate on their own. No one knows what they do. These guys, they're just off on their own. Uh, there's no oversight, no control, and they just do whatever they want. They don't, I mean, and, and they're evil, man. These people are evil. Uh, you know, do I think it goes to Bill Clinton and to the Congress? There may be guys up there that knew about it. They're not going to say anything, man. If they say anything, you know, they're, they're through, you know. For those of you who don't know, and I, I, knew, I knew Marine snipers that, I, and, I, and I've heard other guys talk about it, and, and, uh, I've heard that, that these guys, you know, they go on the streets and they stalk people and they kill them. Uh, I know that Air Force, I know that, excuse me, the Army Airborne snipers do the same thing. They use Delta Force to, uh, to, go, to go grab these people and silence them by killing them. Uh, and maybe something else ought to tell them. Well, you know, if this goes on, uh, where do they get the money to finance all this and stuff? Well, very simply, either they're selling arms, they're selling drugs. A lot, a lot of this business about you know having uh, the spec ops and they get these unlimited amounts of money. Well, they're not coming. It's not coming from the government coffer. 
that's coming from running drugs or weapons or, you know, the selling of, of a hardware or whatever. He knew that there was something going on that was a big secret that he could not divulge. Werner von Braun actually told me that the spin was a lie, that the premise for space-based weaponry, the reasons that were going to be given, the enemies that we were going to identify, were all based on a lie.